We're going to get started with continuation passing style. Okay? So here's the Menti code. I presume most of you know by now. If you, if you need to remember this, you can just look up the slide online. So I'll just skip through this. Anyways, OK, we're going to be talking about this idea of pipelines. If you were not clear on pipe, the usage of the pipe operator from last lecture, we will be using it a lot today. All right? And we'll talk about what this thing called continuation passing style even is. Oops. And then we're going to be talking about see how we can translate functions into a style that is the CPS style. Uh, and then we'll talk about the implications for control flow. Okay? Uh, but that's our schedule. So, oh my goodness. All right. So this is going to be embarrassing because here's what I'm going to have to do uh, really fast. Um, so, all right. Anyways, does anyone have any questions about the homework, about the class, about this thing called CPS? What we're doing is we're waiting for my LaTeX to compile because I forgot to um, uh, compile the lecture slide specific version before this lecture. Uh, and that will take a pretty second, like around uh, 40 seconds. But um, last time we talked about higher order functions, right? And we talked about staging, uh, which doesn't have a whole lot to do with this lecture. But what's important is the fact that we did it. And what's also important is the fact that we can do currying, right? And we can have map and fold, and we can have these pipes, which let us sequence operations in a way that's more particular, that's nicer to read. If I have f of g of x, instead I can write x pipe g pipe f, right? Uh, and that's just a nicer way for me to structure my computations. We're going to be talking about another way we can kind of do that. So here's the idea. We defined pipe last lecture as such, right? And this lets us produce code like this. I take the, the the list one, two, three, I pipe it into map int two string, right? Which means I apply map int two string to this list. So I get the list string one, string two, string three. Then I pipe that into fold r. Uh, can someone actually tell me what this does? Does anyone have any hypothesis as to what this does? Yes, delimited by delimited by commas. Actually, a weird quirk of that is that it'll actually produce. It'll actually produce 1, 2, 3, which is unfortunate, but sometimes that happens. Um, it's not important what this does, but the important part is that we can pipe these operators like this that lets us read it in a nicer way. It lets us read it linearly, right, from top to bottom. And this works pretty well for our purposes, but what if I change up the problem a little bit on you, okay? What if I have a list of strings and I want to turn them in integers and I want to get the average, okay? Like I'm Summing up your grades, for instance, finding the average of your grades. Well, suppose again it's string one, string two, string, well, it's now the strings, okay? One, two, and three. Here's what I'm going to do I'm going to map them with the function int.fromString, which unfortunately returns an option. So I'm going to use option.val of. Don't do this. Don't, that, that function just takes things out of sum and raises an exception if it's none. Uh, I know that this won't happen, but please don't actually ever do this, okay? So now I have, at this point, I have the list one, two, three, right? And then I pipe it into a land expression. I bind it to the name L. I do fold r op plus 0, which is the sum function, right? So I sum up everything in the list. And then I divide it by the length of that list L. Is everyone clear on why this should produce the average of all of these numbers uh, interpreted as integers? So this is one thing I can do. But here's my claim to you. This is gross, because I kind of hate having to write this lambda that I pipe it into, right? When I write map int from string, I can write it without the lambda. I could write it with the lambda, but I don't have to. Okay? We're going to see how we can improve upon this by making our computations more explicit. Because one nice thing about piping is that every operation comes after each other. I have this, then I do my map, then I do my map, and then here I do, what do I do? I have to go read the body of this, and I figure out, oh, it's a div, so I do the fold r, and then I do the length, and then I do the div. It's not clear. It's non-explicit. Okay? When I write code like this, it's up to the order of operations of the SML compiler as to which operation happens first. I don't know which one of these happens first. You know, I told you that we evaluate tuples in left to right, right? But you have to rely on your knowledge of that. Whereas here, I know that I must do the map and then the other map. Okay? Does everyone see my point? That like it's more explicit to do this than it is to like bind it to a lambda and then just do whatever on the inside. Okay? So we're going to try and recoup that advantage by making it a very explicit step where every line is its own operation. All right? Um, and you know we had to. And also, another comment is like we could we had to write it this way because we need to reuse the list L um, uh, inside of this length, list L length. I couldn't like pipe it immediately into fold R because then I'd lose the list. Okay. Um, I remember the promise. Okay. All right. Can we do better? Is the question. And the answer, oh my God, is yes, we can. All right. Here's what we're going to do. Remember the idea of eta expansion, which means that if I have a function f that is extensionally equivalent 
to fn x goes to fx for any function value or valuable function expression f, OK? And you should believe me on this. Uh, I just have introduced an argument and given it explicitly. But these two things are equivalent, OK? Um, let's use that to explicitly call each of these things, each of these lines, a lambda. Ah, uh, geez. I don't know what that says, but that's OK. Um, we're going to use this to call everything a lambda. And this looks scary, OK? So let's work through it. All right. What I have done is I have taken each previous line, and I've explicitly turned it into a lambda expression. Instead of, instead of map int to string, we know that this is actually extensionally equivalent to a lambda expression. Fn x goes to map int to string x, right? This is extensionally equivalent. So I can just translate this to that by referential transparency. So here, that is all I've done. Okay? I introduced an explicit list L1, which is what 1, 2, 3 strings are. And I gave it to map uh, int from string. Then I piped this whole result into another lambda that takes in that result and calls it L2. So L1 is a string list. L2 is an int list. Then I do map option.val of L2, and I pipe that into L. So now I get, actually, this is a uh, int. Int option list, sorry. Uh, and I get an int list. Okay? And then here now we see every operation happens on a single line. One line I do the map, int out from string. One line I unpack the options. One line I sum. One line I get the length. And then the final line I divide. Okay? All I'm doing is making this very, very explicit, even though it's quite hard to read. Another comment about this is uh, I've seen some people asking this on Piazza. If I have something like fx pipe gx, or any infix operator. Uh, I'm used to this at this point, but this bears noting. When you want to read this, infix operators go last. That means that if I ever see like a large amount of, of infix operators surrounded by other things, for instance, x cons y cons z, or fx cons g y cons h z, okay? um, the way I read this is I read this as three groups of things. Because the infix operators go last, so they always partition the other things. Okay? That's the way you should think about it at least in the absence of mixing several infix operators. But that bears noting, OK? Is everyone relatively clear on what this says and what this is doing? I'm just, it's a different, I haven't introduced any special syntax. It's just lambdas and pipes, OK? OK. So we can do this, all right? Um, but we actually prefer to indent things a little bit differently, OK? Uh, I actually, pref this is exactly equivalent. I've just changed the indentation a little bit. So now when I do one, two, three, I pipe that into a lambda that has L1. So I bind this to L1. Then I do the map int up from string L1. And then I bind that to L2, and then so on and so forth. So the, the thing I'm binding it to is the end of the line on which it appears. OK? And is everyone relatively assured, like, this will produce the result of the total divided by the length, OK? Because of how I constructed this. The advantage now is that I've explicitly named every single argument. And now I have free license to use this L twice. Now, I, now it's no big deal that I can do the list out length of L. So this is, these pipes are verbose, but they're more explicit is the idea. Okay? But this is just equivalent to the previous. Okay? Um, and I already said that. Okay? So this is nice and sequential, and it doesn't rely on your intuition or your understanding of how SML does things. It's just top down. Okay? Um, and in case you're having more trouble reading this, which I was concerned about, I've, I've furthermore made it like this. So the thing you have to realize is that this is a gigantic lambda expression. Everywhere from this red left paren to this red right paren is just one big lambda expression that I'm putting it into. Okay? But the body of that lambda expression is map int dot from string L1, where I pipe that into yet another orange, very large lambda expression whose body is so on and so forth. Right? But these lambdas are just containing each other. They're very large lambda expressions, but we're just evaluating the body, which is itself like a nested lambda expression kind of deal. Okay? I thought this might be easier for you to read, um, uh, given how we traditionally indent things. Okay? But this is exactly the same thing as this. I've just indented them slightly differently. Okay? Yes? Yes, this. So I haven't exactly applied this equivalence, because then I would have just piped into fn x goes to map int dot from string x. I've actually made it a little bit more complicated, because I wanted to surround this entire piping expression. So this is not the exact equivalence I'm applying. You're correct about that. But it's similar in intention, where it'll maintain equivalence. Okay? Yeah. Um, essentially, you can think of it as these 
these pipes left to associate. It's like parens pipe map into from string pipe map to option dot of parens. But here, actually, what I've done is I've right associated it. It doesn't actually matter, um, but I have for I think readability purposes. This makes it easier to read. Okay, um, but good point. Okay, uh, but we're gonna move on. All right. Um, okay. So this is just a very large lambda expression, okay? It's a very large sequence of operations. Uh, but let's move on. So let's, but let's revisit this, right? Every time I'm doing a thing, it's destined to be piped into a lambda that does the next thing, right? That's, that's what I've, this, this sort of protocol I've adopted. Um, but why should I do that? Because I kind of want to save on these characters. I don't want to have to pipe explicitly. So what if, here's an idea. Here's an idea for you. What if instead of having to do f, x, y, pipe this function, and we're going to call it k for a mysterious reason, okay? What if instead we had a, where it's this, right? We compute this, we go this to a value, and then we go to k of v, right? That's the way that this works. Um, what if instead of that we did this? f prime x, y, k. k is now a curried parameter to this new function called f prime, where f prime has the law that f prime x, y, k should be extensionally equivalent to uh, k of f, x, y. Do you agree with me that if this law holds, then we could write this instead of that? If this function were defined in a way that f prime, given the next, the next function to do, k, was equivalent to k of its result, this would be OK to do by, by definition. I would actually step the definition of, of pipe, and we'd see that this would be the same thing as what this is equivalent to, right? So we're going to roll with it. I'm not going to tell you why yet, but we're going to roll with it, OK? Um, and we're just going to get rid of these pipes. We're going to make each of these lambdas an argument to the function that appears before it, OK? And what it'll look like is it'll look like this. Uh, we're going to call such a function cool, OK? A function that takes in this k and is equivalent to k called on this original function is called a cool function. And I hope you believe me that all I've done is I've changed these names to cool, and I've eliminated the pipes. So now it is. Uh, sorry, this pipe should still be there. Um, but now it is, I pipe into this lambda. What's the body of the lambda? It's map cool given this argument, given this list, and given this argument. Not piped into this lambda, given the lambda as argument. OK? And our protocol is just that, hopefully, since map cool is defined in this way, right, we can literally use referential transparency to show that this is equivalent to what I had before. Because we have a law saying map cool FLK is equal to literally map fl pipe k, k applied to map fl. Does everyone believe me that if I apply these equivalences, if I replace every instance of map cool, full dark cool, and length cool with the right hand sides, we get exactly what we had on the previous slide? You can take a second to think that through, yes. The y will come later. I'm not claiming readability yet. Okay. This, that will, the Y will come late. The Y is a hard one. Yes. Uh, K is not an argument here. Sorry. Uh, that should be an argument. You're correct. Yes. Good, good call. Okay. Okay. So I just want you to follow me along why this should happen. Yes. Why it should be true. Yes, because functions are values. So I'm, this k is indeed that lambda expression. Oh. Yep, yep. So if we apply equivalences, we'll get that this is literally just pipe of that. Right. OK. Um, OK. As long as everyone's on the same page, we'll move on. I just want, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is we're trying to arrive at a very complicated thing. And I'm trying to take very small steps of equivalence to show you that if you're following along, what I say at the end should be true. OK? As long as you can follow along each step I'm saying, then what I say will naturally follow. OK, but again, why should we do this? Because actually, one of the motivations was, oh, we bind this to the same thing on the same line. Well, we have that. It's called a val declaration. So why didn't we write this? Which you all agree is much more readable, right? You all understand what this says quite handily, I imagine. Um, why didn't we do this? The question is, could we do this for every single function? What happens if I wanted to do this, where I kind of desugar everything to these explicitly named arguments, these explicitly named declarations on each line? What if I did that for a recursive function? Here's what I get. 
Let's write fact with that, right? So what I'm going to do is, uh, again, we're trying to keep with this protocol where I explicitly name each result, OK? On each line, I get a new answer, and I explicitly name it. So the first thing I do is I compute fact of n minus 1. I bind it to the name rec ands, and then I do n times that, bind it to the name res, and I return res, OK? So this is, this is in the hypothetical of why don't we do the lets. Does someone see a problem here? Why should I not do this? There is a reason why we should not do this. Yes? The non tail recursive was what I was looking for. It is not tail recursive. If I do this, if I do this for a recursive function specifically, if I have to bind my recursive result and then do something after, that's the definition of not being tail recursive, right? So I can't do this thing and maintain my tail recursive property, OK? If it was fine up here, up here it was fine because we weren't defining a recursive function. This was just some sequence of operations. But in a recursive function, sometimes I have to make a recursive call. And if I did this, and I did do this here, no bueno. Because now I have to do this and then wait to come back later and do something else. Not tail recursive, not efficient, not good. OK? So let's make it tail recursive. Um, and I'm just going to work, work through this. I don't think it's worth writing it on the board. Uh, but if I wanted to write a tail recursive version of fact, uh, I could write it such that I keep an accumulator of type int. At the beginning, it's going to be 1, and I return it. Well, at the end, it's, I'll return the accumulator. And every time I do t fact n minus 1, sorry, that's a typo, t fact of n minus 1, and I multiply the accumulator by n, right? And does everyone believe me this is how you'd write factorial tail recursively? You can take a second to process it. I know I'm moving fast. So I just multiply it by each step, right? Not, not dissimilar than t length or t rev, OK, if that were n minus 1. That's OK, and that's straightforward. Now we have our tail recursive fact. What's the problem? Well, let me give you this, actually. So let's try to do that, but let's do it differently. Um, let's do a tail recursive map. So f, l, and then an accumulator, right? At my base case, I'm going to return my accumulator. In my recursive case, I take in f. I take in x cons x's, I take in ack, and I'm going to evaluate this to t map of f of x's, where in my accumulator I cons fx to it, right? Well, what's the big look? Why did I do this? What's the issue? Yeah. I reversed the list. Remember t rev? This is actually pretty much t rev, except I now incorporated this f function. So the problem here is that I've reversed the list. This is not map. So I thought it would be super cool to like do this like tail recursive thing. Let's like do the tail recursive thing. But it's not obvious. It's not obvious how I should do that. I'd probably have to reverse the list afterwards. Okay? Um, so this is incorrect. Uh, I just want to show you that t int map, t map of int two string one two three is going to be string three string two string one because of the reversing thing we talked about, right? And if you follow this, basically, I re-implement the map I just showed you. I, re I uh, redo t rev, which we've already seen. And I show you that we can do map by doing the t map backwards and then t rev. But wow. But wow, I had to jump through some hoops to do that. Okay. The reasoning for why we're doing what we're doing, okay, and it seems really weird and like unintuitive, the thing we're doing is not strictly meant to be human readable. This is an idea where we're having com we can always derive a tail recursive function for any function. And computers can do it for us. Okay? We can write a program that takes in map and then brings us the tail recursive version. What I'm showing you today is how we're going to kind of think about, first of all, understand why it works, and then second of all, understand how to do it. It's called CPS, and it's called CPS translation. Okay? So our, our end goal at the end of the day is automatically create tail recursive functions. Okay? Because my motivation to you is it's not obvious how to write tail recursive functions for many functions. For map, like this. I, I mean, by way of analogy, you know t rev reverses. And this almost looks right, but it's not. Okay? Rely less on your intuition, rely on proof. Okay? So this is an easy mistake to make, to think that this is tmap, but it's not. All right. Is everyone following so far? All right. Okay. Can we make this more natural? How do we do this translation in an easier way? Well, I'll show you. Okay? Uh, and it's going to have to do with pretty much this thing we just showed. So let's recap. How did we get here? How did we get, go on this journey and arrive where we're at now? 
we want you to write nicely sequenced operations. We wanted you to put things on their own lines and make it very, very explicit what we did at each step. And then two, we wanted to be explicit about what they were called. We wanted to bind each result to a name because we might have to use it in a later step. Okay? Binding it to a name is more powerful than not, even though it's not human readable, I agree. Okay? Um, and one way to solve this is what we did earlier, which is by making cool functions that take in lambdas of what they need to do next. Okay? These cool functions are going to be the crooks of the argument. Okay? They're going to be the core, the core part. Um, we can do this with let expressions, right? except that it doesn't get tail recursion. Okay? I agree with you that let expressions would get everything, except it wouldn't be tail recursive. We're trying to do this because, in a part, we're going to try and get tail recursive functions. Okay? Um, all right. And we call this continuation passing style. Okay? What are the questions on this? I realize I haven't told you what CPS is. I will in a bit. But we're going to move on. Okay. What is this CPS thing? What is continuation passing style? I had a friend who once called it customer's problem solutions. That's actually not what it stands for. It also doesn't stand for child protective services. But what this CPS thing, well, first of all, let me tell you what um, a continuation is. All right? A continuation is really a, a function that tells you what to do next. Remember those cool functions that took in of argument k, and then that they gave their, their um, they gave their return value to that function k. That k is called a continuation. A continuation is a function that you give as an argument that says, what do I do next? All right? It tells you what to do next. It's named as such because it tells the function how to continue, in a sense. When I'm done, how do I continue? What's my next move? All right? um, uh, don't let them know your next move. Well, the continuation is the next move. So if I had map cool here, which takes in this k, this is a cool function that takes in the continuation k. Because it takes map fl and it pipes it into k, right? Um, so we call that a continuation function. It is not a continuation passing style function, though. Okay? There's a difference here, and I will get to that in a second once I see people stop writing. Okay? But this is our idea of a continuation. All right? It's just an extra functional argument. It's a higher order function. I'll tell you that the type of a CPS function changes in a very predictable way. If I have a function of type t1 to t2, if I want to obtain the CPS version of this function, call it f underscore CPS, the type is going to become this, t1 arrow t2 to alpha, to alpha. All I've changed is I've replaced the t2, or I, rather I've added an extra argument of type t2 to alpha, which is the return type, and then I changed the return type to alpha. Okay? And you should see this because of the fact that map cool originally, well actually let's not do that one. Um, if I had fun add x, y, it was x plus y, right? This is type int star int to int. Hmm? Oh, sorry, it's curried. Yeah, you're right. Int to int to int. Um, we can arbitrarily generalize this for as many curried arguments as we want, actually. If I wanted to write add cool, well, what would I do? x, y. And then I add the continuation, k, and then I just say that it's equal to k of x plus y, or x plus y pipe k, right? And this is type int to int to, well, this k must take in the result, which is of type int, right? So it must take in something of type int, and it must return anything. It's, it's not constrained. I don't know. So it's polymorphic. And my return type is whatever the return type of my k argument was, so it's alpha. Does everyone see why this should have the type it is? So the, when I'm telling you that like, continuations change in a predictable way, it's very predictable, right? I just add in an argument that takes in the return type and returns whatever, and my return type is whatever. Okay? That is the type of any CP, well, almost every CPS function. Okay? Um, so it's very predictable. All right? We're just adding a continuation. That's all that's happening. All right? Again, we're building on, we're build, this is a, probably the most cumulative lecture so far. Okay? We're adding to your knowledge. All right. Uh, and the return type is polymorphic because we don't care what the continuation does. It might be it might be a return an int, it might return a bool, who cares? Yes. Yeah, so here I was doing an example that only had one type arrow in it. Uh, this is confusing because t2 itself is a function type. I'm gonna say this where t2 is not like like I could I could generalize a process for t1 arrow t2 arrow t3. Unfortunately, there's not an easy way to write this out because it actually like because these right associate. 
Um, this would be true were it to take into argument or take in one argument and give back one value. Uh, but this derivation should still make sense. Yes. Are not the same thing. Uh, if you gave this one the identity function, which is fn x goes to x, this should evaluate to the original function given the same arguments. Because then we'd say, what do I do with, so f, f just does something, f does anything. But the, the law we have, the law that we want to have is that f cps, let's say it takes in a single argument, okay, xk, any cps function should have this be true. The CPS version, given the continuation as an argument, needs to be equivalent to calling the continuation on the result. A CPS function has a, a pact, a contract, a protocol. It always passes its return value to the continuation. That is a guarantee. Okay? And you should that should make sense also because in this type, how else would it return an alpha type? It couldn't return anything of type alpha unless it got an alpha via this function. Okay? Um, which might not be obvious to see, so it's okay if you don't um, uh, get that exactly. But this is the idea that's driving us, okay? This is why we're doing the translation, okay? Okay, okay so the type changes in a predictable way. That's the idea. Um, and I actually already did this for you, but I'm, uh, yeah. So we wrote out add, and if I add out, if I do add CPS, um, this one I claim to is CPS, but let's call it cool, okay? Uh, I just take in the K and apply it, right? That's what I put on the board already, all right? So the type changes in a predictable way, all right? Um, but is it always this simple? Because what if I wanted to write the factorial function in CPS? Okay? Uh, and actually, I don't think I'm going to write this yet. Okay. So I could write this. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do the CPS thing, remember, is I wanted tail recursion. This is very not tail recursive. If I give, remember, this is the original fact, right? If I give this fact 10 billion, my computer is going to die because it's going to have to remember to do 10 billion things. Okay? Uh, so this is not a good idea. This is what we'll call like cheating. Okay, we're going to write, ask you on, on your homework, we're going to say write this function in a CPS way. And if you write the direct style function and then pass that into k, you're going to get constraints up. You're going to, you're going to get no points because this is not CPS. Okay, this trivializes the problem because it's not tail recursive. Okay? So how can we write this? Well, we're going to have to rewrite fact entirely. Um, so basically the thing I just wanted to say is um, that was basically everything I just said. Okay? We're going to have to rewrite the fact function from scratch in order to make it CPS. All right? This will be true for any recursive function we want to write in CPS. And I believe we do this on this next slide. Um, OK. Oh, sorry. It's not. Oh, yes, OK. Uh, oh, no, yeah, another note also is like this, this idea I've been building up and staging with you is cool functions. CPS is cool. That's a life lesson, which means that any CPS function is a cool function. It takes in a continuation. It passes its um, result to the continuation. But not every single cool function is CPS, because we can see that this fact CPS quotation is cool. It takes in a continuation and passes it. It's not CPS because it's not tail recursive. Okay? So another way to think about it is cool plus tail recursive equals CPS. That's another way to think about it, okay? Where cool is again as I defined it earlier. All right. Okay. We're going to define a cooler function that manages to be tail recursive even through its recursion. So uh, here are the rules for CPS, okay? We say a function is CPS if it fulfills these three criteria. One, it needs to be cool, right? It takes in a continuation and it uses its continuation. Two, it makes calls to other functions with continuations as tail calls. That means it's, that is like it makes calls to other functions that, have, that are cool, but only as tail calls. You can't like call two CPS functions and then use the results. It needs to be tail recursive all the way through. That's the idea, okay? And then three, it only calls its continuations as tail calls. So you can't do something like k x plus y plus 2. You can't do this, because this would also constrain the output type of the continuation k, right? The k shows us what to do last. It's the very last thing that happens, so I only can do it as a tail call. All, right? all three of these things must be true to make a CPS function. All right? So we'd say like the original fact did not satisfy 1. Uh, two is not satisfied by, I guess, um, uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be satisfied by this one we just defined up here, because it makes a non-tail call to fact, which is not tail recursive. Um, 
And then if I did this like k of x plus y plus two thing, that would not satisfy three, okay? So tail recursive all the way down basically, and cool, all right? I realize we haven't seen a whole bunch of definitions, but hopefully this will make more sense once we see a couple examples, okay? All right, remember that this is what we had when we tried to do facts, right? We wrote this giant let thing, which is fine, for if, if not readable, um, and we wanna convert this to a CPS style, all right? Um, so actually, uh, we're gonna do that on the board now, I think. Uh, how do I rewrite this function in CPS? Well, okay, it's most helpful to write a function in CPS if you are starting from it originally. So we're gonna do fact n equals let val rec ands equals fact of n minus one, and then val res equals n times, I should've written this earlier, sorry, uh, rec ands, and then we just return res, right? And sorry for those of you on the left where this is hard to see, but it's just what's on the board right there, okay? All right. For recursive functions, I have to do this a little bit more, more elaborately, right? Because I can't do this. I can't just say, let this equal to this, right? Why? Because this is now no longer a tail call, right? I can't just add the continuation and expect to get the result. Another thing is, remember what I said about the type. Fact n minus one of k should now return to me an alpha, which means I, I can't use an alpha. I can, I can only return an alpha, right? Because it could be anything. If I do anything, basically, if I do anything with an alpha value, I've, I'm probably gonna constrain the type, okay? So to do this, I don't wanna do what I just showed you here. So how can I possibly make this happen? Here's what we're gonna do, all right? The difference between writing a function in CPS versus not, between doing this and then doing what I'm gonna show you, is the difference between what I'll call writing down instructions and remembering instructions, okay? The difference between now and later. If I want to do something, if I want to do anything, okay, I can write down instructions for what to do right now and then give it to someone and have them do it. Or I could have someone come back to me with something and then remember that I have to do stuff to it later. Let me give you an example, all right? Can I get a volunteer from the audience? There's a precisely one person, yeah, okay. All right, as, as volunteer. Okay. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stand over here, uh, and then my legs are tired. So can you go over there and get that paper that's on the table for me? Don't look at it yet. Just give it to me. All right. Thanks. All right, uh, can you go get me another one, actually? Thanks. Anyways, so um, what we're gonna talk about is this difference between now and later. And so now and later, can you get me another one? Thanks. Uh, now and later, which is that to do anything, I can remember to do it right now and then write down instructions, or I can have a subservient person do it. Thanks. And then, oh, oh you remember to do it, cool. Um, and, then, and, then, uh, and then do it later. But the point is that every single time, geez, can you stop handing me these? Actually, you know what? Every single time that he does this, I have to remember to rip this up. And I, I get distracted in the middle of my lecture. So actually, you know, can you go over there and grab it and just rip it up yourself? Thanks. No, do it. And then now I'm free to do whatever it is I want. And now I don't need to think about what he's doing because I know someone will do it. All right? Thank you. That was it. Thank you. Good job. Good job. All right. The difference here was between me saying, go do this and then bring it back to me. And then later on, I have to remember, oh, you handed me this thing. Now I got to rip it up. I have to remember to do that. But, and that takes up space in my brain, and it interrupts me in the middle of what I was doing. Or I tell someone, hey, can you go do it for me? Then I don't think about it anymore. I know that it's going to get done, all right? This is the distinction, all right? And, and I'm going to make the analogy make sense in a second here, okay? All right. Here's another analogy here, which is that um, uh, my friend, oh, actually, no, I'm not going to give you this analogy. This was the alternate analogy. This is the analogy for people who aren't in the live lecture. Um, uh, so that's going to, all right. This is what I call the later mindset. Okay, this is the later mindset. I say, do fact of n minus one. Give me the result, go get the paper. And then later on when it comes back to me with n minus one factorial, I have to remember to multiply it and return it. That's later, I have to do that later. And later is bad, later takes up space in my brain. The difference is now. Now if I were to tell the computer, go do the multiplication later. Okay, well not later, but like now I'm gonna tell the computer to do something for me then I don't have to remember to do it later. I'm gonna show you the alternative. This is just the later example, okay? Now is good, 
now is dynamic, now gets invited to parties. Okay? So we're going to do the now. All right. So the idea is just that we're trying to prevent this thing where we have to do stuff later. We're trying to prevent tail recursion. So how do we do the now? Uh, we're going to write fax CPS, which is of type int to parens into alpha to alpha. Okay? And here's how I claim we're going to do it. All right? I think I just gave you the whole implementation. Yeah. Okay. Here's my edit, edit distance. Okay? I'm being very deliberate about what I do to show you the difference. Okay? I give it a k argument, right? Then, oh, sorry, I'm going to move this back, actually. I call k wherever I was originally returning a value, right? Because I give the output value to my continuation. So I call k on every time I return. I, I return, the function returns, OK? And then finally, I can't do this non-tail call. Here's what I'm going to do. This is out of scope. This hasn't been bound. What if I did this instead? I put this entire thing in a lambda expression. And I'm going to show you on the board so it's actually like, easy to see. Okay? This is the edit distance. I, what I happened is I took this entire thing that I said we were originally going to evaluate to, and I put it in a lambda expression where I said, first, 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 right now, do the fact CPS on n minus 1. And then, recursive leap of faith, whatever this lambda takes in is the result of factorial of n minus 1. Right? I pass a, a CPS function has to pass its output to a continuation. So therefore, I get it. But now I'm in here. But the key is now I don't have to make a recursive call. I made the recursive call first, and I got the value. This is all tail recursive. Okay? The difference I want to illustrate to you between what I had on the board earlier and, what, and this, that's later. That's let me do the fact, and then later remember what to do. Okay? Here it's I make a singular tail call to fact CPS, and I never come back. The last thing that happens here is this call to fax CPS. Because right now, I wrote down an instruction. I said, when you get your answer, when you get the factorial of n minus 1, do this later. Now. I can't, OK. <laughs> uh, I realize later is an unfortunate choice. Let me say after. OK? With the continuation, do this. But do you, do you, do you see how this fax CPS thing is a, is a tail recursive call? It's the last thing that we do. Because, oh, maybe it's actually not clear. So, Everything here is in a lambda expression, right? And that means that things inside lambda expressions don't get evaluated. If I have fn x goes to 1 plus 1, I don't get fn x goes to 2. One, uh, goes to two. I get fn x goes to 1 plus 1. A lambda expression freezes its contents in time. So here, when I freeze the contents of this in time, the last thing I do is I call fax CPS, but I give it a lambda. I give it a lambda that says what to do with the continuation. So this lambda is what I call an instruction, right? It doesn't do anything. It's it's because it's frozen in time. It can't do anything until it gets an input called rec ends, right? Functions are instructions in a sense. Um, but later on, once this continuation is used, when the continuation is eventually used here or here, and I'll show you what that looks like, then we will do what this is is. Okay? So the this is kind of an analogy where it's a little more clear to me than I think it is to you necessarily. But to me, this looks like telling Stephen, rip up the paper later. Okay? I'm going to tell you to rip up the paper so I don't have to remember to do it later. And I give it a lambda. I give him a lambda that says rip up the paper. Okay? That's how I see it. All right, it might be confusing. Any questions on this? I know this is just conceptual right now. We will, I, will, I have a lot more padding to do. Yes? I just thought it'd make the diff nicer. I thought it'd make it easier to see the, the difference. I, re I replaced the recursive call with putting everything into a lambda expression where I had the recursive call. Yeah. OK, we're going to move on. Uh, yes? So on the first call, the, oh, the k can be anything. The k is an argument to fax CPS. If I want to call fax CPS, I can give it an original k that says to, if I gave it like f and x goes to x, then it would be equivalent to fact. Okay? But it could be different. Okay? It doesn't need to be, but it could be. The, for, for all intents and purposes, think about k as originally being this. Okay? Um, I know I haven't shown you how this k changes, but this k is changing. What I want you to think about okay, is recursive leap of faith. Before you go and step through it, recursive leap of faith, if fact CPS does what it 
should do, which is that it satisfies the law I just erased, which is that fact CPS given k should evaluate to k of fact. That means that this thing should evaluate to this lambda given the factorial of n minus 1, right? And if it did, that would be the correct return value, right? So recursive leap of faith, think about it. I know that this doesn't make any sense because you haven't seen how this changes, but I will show you. But recursive leap of faith, think about the fact that what I'm saying is that I'm taking in a lambda that takes in my result. If this is the result, this is the answer. Yes? We should because the k is changing. The k is an accumulator, actually. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, I suspect we should move on. Yeah. I am not piping it. I'm doing the cool thing where instead of piping it, remember, we got rid of the pipe by giving the argument that it was going to be piped into, the lambda that it was going to be piped into, into the function itself. The function calls itself on uh, the, the continuation. Right? Instead of doing, instead of doing fx pipe k, I instead made a function f prime that if you give it k, it's extensionally equivalent to k of fx. This is what I did. This is the idea of a cool function. A cool function just takes in a continuation and then calls it. Okay? I think we're going to move on because this will be more clear with more examples. And I really I want to make sure we finish. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't exactly know what you mean by double functioned. We would pass an original k, which was the double function. We would like say, fact CPS re double, yeah. and I would I guarantee you that this would evaluate to twelve. I'll show you a trace in a little bit. Yeah, I'm gonna get moving though because I suspect we're gonna run out of time otherwise. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So. The point is writing instructions now versus remembering later. Okay, that's the distinction I want to show. And the distinction between that is the distinction between tail recursive and not. Uh, what was I going to say on this slide? Yeah, I think that's pretty much what I was going to say. Okay, um, the continuation is a functional accumulator. That's another thing I should say. We're making the accumulator. We're doing fact CPS with an accumulator. It's just that the accumulator is a function. All right, that's another way to think about it. Okay, key. This is the key conceptual divide. All right, it's a accumulator that is also a function. I think I'm going to get to the trace. I think that's the important part right now. Um, and then once more, OK, the, the analogy I'm trying to draw here is in a direct style function, which is fact as I originally drew it, I had to remember to do this after the fact. Versus in a CPS function, I write down, I write down this lambda. This lambda is what I write down right now, because then it's what's done. It's what the continuation will do. OK? All right, we're going to get to the trace, because this is going to help a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, and more, more credence to this idea of lambdas as instructions. If I have something like fn onions goes to onions, pipe, chop, pipe, grill, pipe, put sandwich, in intention, in conceptually, what I've done is I've written down a laundry, a recipe list that said, take the onions, chop the onions, grill the onions, and then put the onions on a sandwich. But it wasn't done, right? Because lambdas are not evaluated until you give it an argument. Okay? So I'm just trying to codify this idea that lambda instructions can encode information. And they, are, they do it by being these things that are like instructions. Okay? All right, here's the trace. Um, uh, or, uh, if I really want to simplify fact CPS, here's what it looked like. This is the less complicated version to write. When you write your homework, write it like this. Okay? Don't write it like this. You might, uh, I think there's actually good things to do in both cases. Um, all right, so we multiply by n now, and then, okay, no, uh, let's, let's move on. Okay, so if I take this thing that I had here, and I indent it differently, here's what we get. And this looks like what we had earlier, right? Which is that I do fact CPS of n minus 1, and then I give it this continuation that says, with my recursive result, multiply it by n, and then later do k. All right? I'm going to show you the trace by showing you how this thing is built up. Um, OK. Suppose I have fact CPS 3 and then give it an arbitrary k. All right? How, how is this going to step? Well, we're going to use the simplified version I had earlier. OK? Um, but you can believe me that here's what it's going to step to. I will decrement this 3 by 2. It will be a tail call. And I will instead change this k to a new lambda that says 3 times res 1 and pipe into k. Another thing I did also is I, I changed the definition of fact CPS a little bit, sorry. Um, 
I change this so it'll be pipe into k rather than uh, do k of this. It's, it's essentially equivalent, but I changed the notation because I think it'll make your understanding easier, okay? Hopefully this should make sense though, okay? So I change it to this, so it says fax cps of two, then do three times, then do k, okay? Once more, let's step it. Let's step it again. We're going to get one, I make the lambda bigger by making another thing on top where I take in fax cps of one, then I do two times that. Then I do the same thing from before, so it's, it's the same pipeline. I'm building a pipeline by building up the top, okay? And I add a paren on the end too, because I have to, okay? That's not important. Final step, I decrement by one, and I add a new layer which says take in fax cps of zero, multiply it by one, and then pipe it. And by the way, this is like exactly what it steps to, right? I'm not lying to you, I'm not doing essential equivalence. This is the trace, it's just indented nicely, okay? Okay, so this is, if you believe me, this is how fax cps will build up its accumulator. Do you see how the continuation has been an accumulator? I just keep recalling my recursive thing, but I make the continuation bigger, all right? By these yellow things, all right? Now let's see how it's broken down. How do I break down this continuation? I'm going to do this. So we know that fax cps of zero says that, and k says call the k on one, right? Call the continuation on one. So let's call the continuation on one. So I pipe one into it. This is extensionally equivalent, all right? But it's, it's um, equivalent, so I'm just trying to present it to you nicely. So when I pipe one into this, I bind one to res three, right? And then that's one, so I bind that to res two, just one, and then I multiply that by two, that's two, and I pipe it into this function where I bind it to res one, so I get two, and then I do three times two, which is six, and then I pipe it into k, okay? The picture I want you to have here is, what did I do here other than build up a list of instructions. At every single step, what I did is I said, hey, at, at the first time I said, hey, 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 can you, can you take your result and multiply by three? Thanks. And then at the next step I said, hey, hey, uh, before you do that, can you take your result and multiply by two? Thanks. And then next I said, hey, before you do that, take your result and multiply by one. And then eventually when it came to actually discharging this function, I gave it one. And then the instructions ran. We broke down the instructions one by one. Another way you can think about it also is, this is like a list, right? I, 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 put, I prepended to the list, so I cons. I cons instructions onto my function, and then at the very end, from left to right, I break down the instructions, and eventually I come up with six pipe k. Does everyone see what happened here? I think this is the final picture you should have in your head for what is happening, okay? I had to write it with these pipes. This is not exactly how you'll write it on your homework, but you, you can. I mean, I think, actually, I think it makes it easier to understand. Um, but we're just accumulating a list of instructions instead of a list of data. We're accumulating a function, okay? That is the key idea, all right? Um, and you should be relatively assured, without even stepping this, okay? I'm gonna tell you that what this does is it's the identity function. Because I cons on, I cons on um, uh, what to, rather, okay. Onto my list of instructions, I prepend to the front, right? I have, uh, let me actually give me an example. Actually, I, I guess I will show you in theory, okay? If I had one, two, three as my argument to mystery, right? What do I do at each step? I cons onto my list of instructions that I should cons on the thing on top, right? So the very first instruction I say is, hey, can you cons one, right? That was the first thing, and then I take this off and I do another recursive call, and then I say, hey, can you cons on two, right? I'm writing pseudocode, uh, and then I take this off, and the next thing I do is I say, hey, can you cons on three, and then I take this off, and I'm at the end, so I give it, nil. And what is three cons nil? It's three. And what is two cons three? It's two comma three. And what is one cons two comma three? It's one comma two comma three. If you got the intuition correctly, you should see why this will just be the identity function, okay? But this is what we're getting at, okay? Um, all right. And I would like you to check your understanding and verify this. I think it really helps to write it in this way, okay? Like if you can see the, the list of instructions, just, we're just prepending instructions, okay? All right, I've quibbled on for long enough. Um, uh, let me think about if it's a good idea for you to do this quiz, uh, because I'm considering skipping it. I will skip it. I will skip this quiz because I would like more instruction time, yes? Yeah, you won't get house points. I'll, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> sure, all right. Uh, oh yeah, I, I haven't done this in a while. Uh, Plus 10 points to every house. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. No jokes. Hmm? No. 
Anyways. <laughs> well, okay. Anyways, let's move on. No jokes, serious faces. We got a lot to cover. Um, cool. All right. So I showed you this thing, and first of all, is everyone on board with like the CPS thing works? You saw how it worked, you understood how it worked. Like, is everyone clear on that? This is very important. Okay. That being said, it's not necessarily something I can rectify now, but I, I want to make sure everyone's on board. So let's see how we can do this thing called CPS conversion on an arbitrary function. We want to turn an arbitrary function into its CPS equivalent. I already told you this, right? Um, to change the type, we just give it the extra continuation, and we do the thing. All right? Um, so OK. Uh, here is what we're going to do. This is our entire formula for how we make a CPS translation function. OK? So you start with a function. Call it f. All right? For a function with return type t, uh, t2 in this instance, we add a continuation of type t to alpha and change the return type to alpha. OK, I already told you that. That's step one. Step two, we call the continuation on every single return value. I actually already demonstrated this to you, but I'm going to tell this to you in general. And if there's a recursive call, which is like the expression e, like, like fact of n minus 1, I take that and I cross it out and I replace it by a variable, a new variable rec ands. Okay? And then I wrap the entire function in this thing, but the continuation says to do the, what the whole thing is. I'm going to show you this in action on fact. Okay? I'm going to show you basically what I show, or on map, actually. All right. So we have map. This is map. All right. First step, I add the continuation. Okay? Next step, I apply the continuation anywhere I would have re previously returned a value. So that means I call k on nil, and I call k on the body right? in the recursive case. Next step, I have to take any recursive call and I replace it by a free variable, a new variable called rec ands. So that's my recursive call, and I replace it by rec ands, right? And then next, I wrap the whole thing in a lambda that, call, that does the recursive call. So I do the map fx's given a lambda that does everything that we just constructed. Does this procedure kind of make sense? I don't want you to just follow this, because uh, you probably won't be able to on the homework, to be honest. Like, this probably won't generalize super nicely. But, um, I don't want you to just follow this step and then not think. The idea is, what did I do? I added a continuation. Wherever I returned, I had to call my continuation. Why? Because the continuation is my promise. My promise is whatever I return, I will give it to the continuation. So that was adding k. And then by doing this thing where I replaced the recursive call, it's because I had to be tail recursive. I had to be tail recursive, so I bound this recursive answer in the lambda I gave as an argument to the CPS function. Okay? That's what I did. And that produces a CPS function. Three components, the continuation, the packed, and the tail recursion. So actually, that's another way to think about it, OK? Step one is add the continuation. Step two is fulfill the packed. And what I mean by packed is the fact that f of CPS xk, which I've written three times now, should be essentially equivalent to f of k of f of x. This is my packed. To be a CPS function, I have to fulfill this. There are other ways I could fulfill um, uh, the other ones by like looping forever, for instance, uh, that would like make a type check. But this is the only way that fulfills my pact. And then three is make it tail recursive. All right, that is my procedure. Okay, that's all. Okay, and this is the CPS version of map. Okay, any questions on this or why we have these three criteria? Okay, all right. Um, okay. And uh, I have to apply k because it's, yeah, that, that's the path. All right, cool. Uh, okay. Oh, wait, maybe I will have time. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I'll return and, and, yeah, okay. All right. If everyone's cool with what we just did, we can move on to a slightly more interesting example, which is um, if I have a function that returns an option, okay? And you should think about it this way, all right? If I have a function like search, which has this type, oh, I suppose I'll also check menti real fast. Can you demonstrate? Yes, I did. Let's go. All right. Uh, alpha to bool to alpha tree to alpha option. You agree with me this is the type of the search function? I believe I actually implemented it for you here. Yes. Uh, we already implemented this function, so I won't go too deep in depth into it. This is my type. And what I want to say is to CPSify this, I have to turn it into, well, I turn it into the same thing, but now we take in a continuation of type alpha option friends to beta, a new 
polymorphic type. Does everyone agree this is what the type of the CPSified version should be? If you think about it, a function that takes in an alpha option, all it does is it cases on if it's none. Like if it's a function that if it's none, it does something. And if it's sum of x, it also does something, but like maybe with the knowledge that it's x. Okay? I claim to you that this is pretty much like, if you can think about it as two functions. It's a function that does this, that you call if it's none, and it's a function that does this with the argument, if it's sum. Okay? It's like the information's kind of the same. So what I'm going to say is that we're actually going to change the type signature of search CPS to be this one. I take in my original predicate function. Um, I take in my alpha tree. But instead of taking in one continuation, I'm going to take two. I'm going to call it my success continuation and my failure continuation. Because this thing already codifies kind of two pieces of information. The option case, the none case, and the sum case. So I'm going to take in a function of type alpha to beta. Note that it's not in the option. And it'll take in, I'm going to put it on a new line here, unit to beta. Remember that unit is the type that has exactly one value, right? So it's unit to beta is kind of the same thing as the none case, because I give it no no information, in a sense. And I return beta. So I will do, I will do this instead of this. Okay? This is just the way I'm going to structure it. For any, for any function of, uh, that returns an option, we can do this. Okay? We're going to have a failure, a success, and a failure continuation. All right. Um, okay. I already told you all this. Okay. So, uh, and I, I defined it for you there. Okay. Success continuation of type t of of the return type to alpha, and then failure continuation of unit to alpha. Yeah. Skip over. What do you mean? Yeah, but you would have anyways. Like if you called this function on none, you would have skipped the logic in the function that dispatched oh, on yeah. the sum. This is just two two curry arguments. I, I put it on a new line for re legibility. It's no, it's no different. I just took two arguments. Yeah, we'll see. Um, okay. So we're going to take two continuations. And our promise now, our pact, our new pact, okay? Our new pact is going to be this, all right? Our new pact is that for a function f, which returns like an option, uh, we're going to have that f cps of k, and then we're going to, oh, sorry, of x, and then sc and fc. This is what I call my success continuation and my failure continuation. The pact is that if fx is equivalent to none, then it should evaluate to fc given unit. And otherwise, if fx is equivalent to sum of y, then this function should equi uh, evaluate to sc of x. All right, is everyone clear on this pact, this new updated pact? Instead of just evaluating to the continuation of it, we have two continuations and it dispatches. In either case, if I were to return a none, I just call the failure continuation. If I were to return a sum, I always call the success continuation. Yes? Uh, why, 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 why? I was thinking about that as I was writing it. I was like, what should I choose? Why? And then I was like, well, what if I forget about that? But this is the, yeah, good, good, good point. Uh, but this is the new pact. All right, everyone clear on that? So here's before and after, all right? I actually wrote it for you on the board already, but you can write that again if you want. Um, and actually, uh, oops, sorry, 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 this is wrong. Sorry. Um, uh, it should be actually the pact I have on the board. Um, but yes, this is the idea, OK? We're going to try and implement it, OK? And we're going to try, actually, better. We're going to try to um, uh, automate it, in a sense. We're going to follow the procedure for how I would do it. Oh, wait. Hmm. I might not write this on the board. Jeez, OK. Uh, let's write the fun search, and let's just do it, because it's important for you to see it in front of you, I think. So in the empty case, I return none, right? And then in the other case, what I'm going to do, uh, I will also take questions while I'm writing, if anyone has them. Yes. Yeah, this is just search, and we will do the CPS version in a second. 
Okay. Oh, jeez. We, but the failure continuation might change. So it might not always have the same effect. But we give it, the input we give it is not important. So we give it unit. Because yes. it has no data to take in. Uh, maybe I will just write this. <coughs> uh, let, me, let me tell you the algorithm first, okay? Um, uh, the algorithm will be, if I have a function of return type t option, I get two, argu two arguments. I already told you this. The success and the failure continuation. If I return none, instead call the failure continuation. That's just my pact. And then for every time I return sum of x, call the success continuation on x. Again, this is the pact, okay? And then three, if there's ever a case for the, for the function, if there's ever a time where there'll be case on the function, then instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace it with a recursive call to the search CPS function, but I'm going to change the success continuation to take care of the sum case and the failure continuation to take care of the none case. I thought there was a hand. Um, okay, that's the two things I'm going to do. Is everyone clear about this? And I'm going to show you this example right now, actually, I think. Okay, search p uh, l of none, search pr. Uh, this is not an in-order search. It's a pre-order search, actually, but it doesn't matter. Um, and if it's some y, I return some y. Okay, this should be search. Okay, let's follow the algorithm. All right, this is my original function. Let's make it CPS. First step, continuation. Okay, okay. Second step, fulfill the pact. If I get none, oh sorry, not k, okay, my bad. Um, SCFC. Next step, fulfill the pact. If I were to return none, don't. FC of unit for none, right? And in the sum case, instead of sum of y, I return SC of y. And here instead of sum of x, SC of x, okay? That's part two. Part three, there is a case. Instead of doing this case, here's what I'm going to do. Well, first of all, this doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? Because search takes two arguments. Uh, search takes four arguments, rather, sorry. But here it takes two. So we're going to change it. Instead of the case, uh, sorry, this also should be an else. Instead of the case, do a recursive call to search where I give it two things. One of them will be fn rec. And, uh, sorry, this is actually the, the success continuation. Oh, geez. Okay, it'll be better to show you. I realize actually you have to switch the order. Um, so I do the SC and FC. I replace the places I were to return. And then the next step, I identify where are my cases. I have two cases, the none case here and the sum case here. I'm going to make this a recursive call where this is the failure continuation instead, and this is the success continuation. So I make it this. I'm going to go back and forth real fast just so you can see the difference. I, I switched the order also. My failure case, if I didn't find it in the left, and that means my failure continuation was called, I go to the right. If I succeeded in finding it in the left, that is, my success continuation was called, I continue to call the success continuation on it. Do you see how I just took the code from the, the yellow and red code, the thing that's outside after the arrow, and I transplanted it into here, and I gave the extra arguments to the recursive call, okay? This is search CPS. I just changed the name, all right? This is search CPS, and the way you should think about this, so first of all, I wanted to show you the derivation. I wanted to show you how we get it. Two, I want to show you, I want you, I want you to be able to reason about what this does and be able to write this yourself if you have to, okay? When you're reading this code, think about it as, I didn't find it, bam, failure, all right? I call my failure function. If I do find it, bam, I call success. But otherwise, what do I have to do? I have to make a recursive call. But remember, in CPS, instead of making a recursive call and using that recursive call, I make a recursive call and I put my next actions, what I do next, in my continuations. Okay? Right now, I write instructions as to what I should do. All right? So I go and I search on the left. If I find it, I succeed. Bam, I'm done. If I don't succeed, I search on the right. And this will upkeep or keep up our pact. This is a correct search function that maintains this idea, this invariant, okay? All right. Um, this gets really complicated to the point where I don't think it's productive to show you a trace of this. Um, the lambdas are simply a little large, okay? But 
recursive leap of faith, you should be able to think about why this works. Okay? Any questions on search CPS, this idea? You all have no questions? Following along perfectly? Yes? In the recursive call, we are building up data. We're building up instructions, is how I would say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually a good point. So, um, oh, I have a bunch of crap on this board. All right. So one thing to note is that uh, there's this idea of customizability, which is that with the CPS function, I can give it whatever continuation I darn well please, as so long as the types match up, OK? So let's do it. Uh, suppose I have a T tree, OK? Uh, let's call it search CPS. Let's give it a lambda. Let's say uh, I don't, fn x goes to x mod 2 equals 0, so the is even function, essentially. All right, so that's argument one. I give it T, assume that I have some tree, OK? Uh, and then I'm going to give it the next two arguments, which are SC and FC, OK? In the success case, I take in res, which is of type int. It has to be, because this is an int tree, apparently. Um, and what do I do with it? Hmm. Actually, sorry. Uh, I'd rather, oh, no, no, here we go. Yeah, yeah I can make it a string. Uh, found string concat uh, int, right, int dot two string res. Maybe I should have just written out this out to you in the terminal, but that's fine. And the failure continuation, fn unit goes to, I have to return the same type as this, so I return the string. I just said, didn't find jack. This would type check, and what would happen is that if it ever found an element, this would evaluate to found string concat whatever that int was. So like found two, found five, found 150. And if there weren't to be such a thing in the tree, it would evaluate to the string didn't find jack. Okay? But I could customize that behavior. I could do whatever. I could return whatever value I want, because the continuation has the final say. Yes. It's building up in front of it, yes. Yeah, the exact same picture as, as I probably can't show you now because it was a long way away. But remember that list, yeah. Um, oh, gee, maybe, no, it's, not, it's gonna be too far. Um, if you remember, at the very end of our instructions when we did this back CPS trace, we always had this pipe K, and that was always at the end. That K is one of these, by analogy, right? It's, it's, the original K is at the very, very end. We always keep it around, but we just add stuff above it. We say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, the same thing will happen here except twice, right? We'll build up, but with this thing, it'll be uh, complicated because it'll be building up on both of them at once, okay? That's the idea. I, yeah. I haven't actually admittedly tried to do the trace and mulligan, but I think, I think it would probably confuse you more than it would help in this case. Yeah. So I'd say that this is tail recursive because this essentially is a piping into k, right? SC is essentially k. Um, and we do this after, so what's the give? Why is it tail recursive? It's because it's in the lambda. Because it's in the lambda, we don't actually do it out here. We do it, the, the call to search CPS has the job of doing it, not this call, essentially. We shift the burden, we write down the instruction of doing it, but we don't have to actually do it ourselves, if that makes sense, okay? Even though, even though I agree with you, eventually at some point in time, we will call this SC, we will call this guy, if we find anything. But it's still tail recursive because we make a tail recursive call and it's the last thing we do. Okay? We're just shifting everything onto the inside of the lambda. Was there another question? Yes. I think it really helps. Honestly, like when I was making these slides, I, I thought it really helped to like do that derivation. I'd encourage you to try, and then if the but the algorithm might not always like work in a way that it might be confusing. I'd recommend you to try at least, because I think conceptually this really helps in terms of understanding what's going on. When I took the course, I didn't do this, because I didn't come up with this yet. But um, uh, no. So yeah, I, don't know. I think it helps personally. Uh, you all can be the first guinea pigs on that. OK, uh, was there another question from someone? I thought there was. OK. OK, 
But this is our idea, OK? And we can use it in whatever way we want. We can use it in a very general way. I was making sure there wasn't another one that wasn't ripped. I'd have to rectify that if not. OK. So I'm going to spend the last eight minutes talking about the other things that happened previously, OK? Um, the idea here, though, is that CPS conversion is just mechanical. It's very, very mechanical. It's very, very boring, OK? When I did all this stuff, like it was an algorithm to get the CPS version. And it's because, again, this motivation is that computers can do it. Every single function that you write in SML can be made tail recursive, and I think is made tail recursive by the compiler. Okay? It can automatically be done. That doesn't mean that you need to write your functions like this. Again, this is not a point in favor of readability of this. I do not think that's true. There are problems in which this is actually very helpful. Uh, specifically, we'll look at one in two weeks, or sorry, two lectures about regular expression matching. Well, actually, it's really, really nice to do this. Um, but the real point here is that like, this is cumulative. If you have a deep understanding of like, how like, passing in lambdas work, how currying works, how evaluation works. Everything I've told you today has not been new. There's been no new syntax. There's been no new like anything. It's just an application of what you've already seen. Now, granted, a very heavy application, but a, an application nonetheless. Okay? Um, I think I want to go back and kind of stress the point here, where, which is, uh, so when I look at this code, right, the idea is that this SC right, is not going to be your original SC. At an arbitrary recursive call, when I enter this case, this SC will not be this. It's going to be like FN res goes to blah, 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 goes. It's, it builds up on itself. I'm accumulating in my accumulator. Uh, I'm accumulating in my continuation. All right. So like, although we're saying SC and FC, and that might make it unclear to you how this recursion is even happening in the first place, the thing to realize is that it's because the accumulator is changing. We're saying. In, in, in particular, this function really um, uh, accumulates in its failure continuation. The failure continuation gets really big. Okay. Um, yes. Inside of a record. Uh, yes, you could. But yes, yeah, if you were to define the regular C, uh, fact, then you would uh, just. So uh, for instance, we can do fact n is equal to fact cps and fn x goes to x. This is true. Uh, yes, yes. Also, you never actually really use this. There's almost no reason why you should write this. But uh, you know, oh, there's some. We'll see. OK, I just wanted to show you this trace just so you, uh, we can see it again and see how this thing is changing in the last few minutes. But uh, I, I basically have defined fact CPS, but I'm giving it the original k of the incrementing lambda expression. Okay, uh, That's the thing we'll do last. So that means that what I want this thing to reduce to at the end of the day is the factorial of 3, and then I add 1 to it. Because okay? that's my original accumulator, my original continuation. Okay, First step, I case on it. I enter, uh, rather, here we go. Oh, shoot. I'm going to, that's annoying. Uh, whoops. I'm going to get rid of this because it's annoying me. All right, first step, I case on the thing. I have three, or I have zero, or I have n. I have n clearly, so I enter here. And do you see how this lambda has changed? Because this thing here is my original k, but it's k applied to this guy. Again, like um, when I showed it to you with the pipes, it was this piped into that. This is just the original way, which I think honestly makes it a little harder to read. But I want to show you this so you have intuition for it. Okay? So I apply my original k to that, but I put this into a lambda. Okay? In terms of my stack, in terms of like my stack of instructions, uh, in terms of my stack of instructions, what I've said is, essentially, I have a stack, right? Um, and at the very bottom of my stack is call k, all right? And then my next step unra unraveling is I put in. Hey, wait! First, before you do that, do three times res. And then what do I do? I do another step. I case, uh, and I get this, which is what? This thing right here is my original k. Or not my original k, the previous k, right? This one is the one from the previous step. And I apply this to 2 times res, and I put that in the lambda. I'm expanding my instructions by adding a layer onto it. Something else I say is that CPS is like a jelly donut, OK? Because, or like a donut, because I take this thing, and I wrap it in a big lambda. I wrap it in a lambda where I now am applying it to 2 times res. So that means that in terms of like my stack, I put 2 times res on the stack. 
OK, and what happens? OK, another two steps or three steps. Now you can probably predict what I'm going to say next. This is my old continuation, right, the continuation from the previous part. And I wrap that in a lambda, and I give it 1 times res. So on my stack, I finally put 1 times res. OK, and then we're finally done. So we get 0, and we apply this gigantic lambda to 1. And then what happens? I break it down from out to in. In terms, of, It's also a stack. You can think of it from out to in or like a stack. I think this is easier. But um, we see that we're going to take off this layer, right? Because 1 will be given to res. So I break down that layer, and I get 1 times 1. So I break this down. I get 1 times 1. Okay? And then I break down the outer, outer layer once more. I get 1. I give it to that. So I take off this thing. And now this is 1. And now I feed it again into this. So I get the inner 1. And I do 3 times. So I get 3 times 2. And then finally, I just apply, multiply that by 2 and get 6. And I apply it to my original k. Okay? So then finally, I'll get k of 6. And then I'm done. Okay? I just wanted to show you this from two different angles. I, I do think the original way I showed it in the slides is clearer. But like, in terms of like the SML, like the way without pipes, this is what's happening. Again, pre-pending instructions. All I'm doing is I'm adding instructions to a list of instructions. All right, that's, and that's what's happening for any one of these CPS functions. If I do this, what am I doing if not just adding something onto my list of instructions, where that thing is, go look at R. Where I build up, except that now the picture you should have is that I have two continuations. When I go look at node of LXR, and I know that we're about to get out, but I'm going to finish saying this one thing. If I'm looking at node of LXR, my first action is I go and I look left. But I put on the failure stack, hey, search CPS PR da da da. Go look at R. Go look at R. Keep a stack, but now I'm going to go look at R. And then if I fail at any point, I pop off the failure stack. And then if I haven't put anything on else by then, I go look at R. Okay? It's easier to understand like this, but I realize it's difficult to go from the code to that. Okay? But that's what's happening. All right? Okay. That's the end.